Welcome to the Neuraveda podcast for complex health. We feature expert guests who dive into ancient and cutting edge understandings of health and disease. These conversations are about food, lifestyle, and medicine just as much as about nature, culture, and politics. This is not medical advice, and you should still follow your own clinician for your particular care. I'm Jillian Ehrlich, family nurse practitioner, certified in Ayurveda and functional medicine at coming to you from our clinic, Neuraveda Health in Seattle, Washington. And I'm thrilled with our guest today, Dr. Kim Bruno, DCCCN, received her doctorate in chiropractic medicine from the National Institute of Health Sciences in Chicago and completed the Certified Clinical Nutritionist Board Examination. She has continued her postgraduate education through the Institute for Functional Medicine and the Clinical Nutrition Certification Board, ILADS, and Horowitz Lyme Master Courses. Dr. Bruno has dedicated her career to working to find the root cause of patients' medical issues, as well as promoting a prevention model of healthcare. Dr. Bruno is currently the Clinical Director of Outreach and Senior Medical Science Liaison for Vibrant Wellness Lab, and is working to educate providers on the use of functional medicine labs for treating complex patients. Before working at Vibrant, she owned a private practice for 17 years and worked together with a variety of healthcare providers in multidisciplinary practices and was a functional medicine director at the largest immunology clinic in Colorado. Dr. Bruno is a Colorado native who enjoys hiking and paddleboarding. She finds most joy in spending time outside in nature with her husband and two daughters. Dr. Bruno, we're so happy to have you. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's, I mean, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. And I love, I mean, we could talk about Colorado and paddleboarding, but we should stay, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm always up talking about Colorado and paddleboarding. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and today our focus really is that immunology piece, because we're going to be talking about Vibrant America or Vibrant Wellness has a panel called the Neural Zoomer or Neural Zoomer yeah. Plus, which is a series of antibodies. And that's kind of what our focus is going to be today. We use this a lot in our practice. We use a lot of antibody testing. And so that's kind of our global discussion. So thank you for being here for this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Happy to be here. So let's get started and talk a little bit about the vibrant technology, because there's been a lot of discussion about you know, different ways that we check antibodies, different ways we can look at the immune system. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what vibrant does. Okay. So the vibrant, what we like to call the vibrant advantage, or really what sets vibrant apart from most labs that are in the industry is the technology that we use. And so a little backstory here is that our technology, it actually started in the tech company. It started with Nikon and it was then you know, looked at is like, oh, we can use this in more of a biotech presentation or biotech use. Um, and so our first study was done in the detection of celiac disease, looking at different antibodies for celiac. And that was published um, in conjunction with Mayo Clinic. Um, and from there, it just really skyrocketed because of the high level of sensitivity and specificity and high amounts of reproducibility. So in the lab industry, you know, we've been using the same type of technology for since the 70s, this like kind of ELISA detection for antibodies. And so when what we bring to the table is we have something called an immunochip. And that immunochip is a, in fancier words, a protein peptide microarray. Um, but what we're doing is we are separating out these proteins, peptides, recumbent antigens, prior to adhering them onto this silicon plate, which then gets kind of diced up into these little microchips. And I know that it sounds like very futuristic, but it absolutely um, is, it, it is cutting edge. And what happens because they're adhered to this microchip prior to um, creating, you know, or to the silicon plate prior to being put on the microchip, you're going to eliminate the, um, likelihood of cross reactivity. And then when we are looking for, um, the, the reaction of antibody to antigen on the plate, we're also using something called chemiluminescence, which is going to be a much more sensitive detection versus the standard ELISA testing. So now we have an isolated, you know, an isolated, um, recumbent antigen, and we have chemiluminescent testing, which gives us the highest amount of sensitivity and maintains our specificity. 
Now, this is the point of the conversation, especially when I'm talking to patients, that they are like sensitivity, specificity, right? Like, what does all that mean? So I like to give little analogies, and especially when we're going to be talking about the uh, neural zoomer, I talk a lot about different analogies. But the one that I'll talk about here is like the sensitivity is our ability to like identify, to find the needle in the haystack. Mm -hmm. And then the specificity is my certainty that it's actually a needle. It's not a pin. It's not a shard of metal. It's actually the needle that I'm looking for. And you really want to have both of them because if we have a lab who is sensitive, they can find things in the haystack, but they're not specific we may be diagnosing or thinking that we have something that is actually not that what we're looking for, you know, or if we don't have the sensitivity, we might not be able to find it at all. Um, and so because of the technology, because of that combination of using the peptide microarray, using the chemiluminescence, we're going to be able to maintain the highest level of sensitivity and specificity for our patients, which gives our providers the confidence that they need. Hmm. And so is the specificity and sensitivity, those are, those would be for individual tests, correct? It would not be for like, you couldn't say like the neural zoomer, you would say like for this particular each antibody. Correct. Correct. So, you know, we have our validation reports are published there on our website. They can be accessed at any time. Um, specific tests that we have have, you know, like, let's just say our, our tick-borne panel, like we had an article written up in uh, the Journal of Nature on our sensitivity and specificity, but it does have to do with one analyte, right? Our Borrelia burgdorferi. We do have a white paper that just came out this last year, which opens that up to all the Borrelia species, all the co-infections, all the opportunistic infections. And that's in preprint right now, still under peer review. So it does have to be, when we talk about sensitivity and specificity, it is going to be per analyte, um, you know, per recumbent antigen, per, um, you know, each individual thing. So we can't say, you know, the overall, the sensitivity of the neural zoomer or the tick-borne is X, Mm -hmm. But we can also give a range, right? So we can say, you know, where our sensitivity is somewhere between, you know, 95 and uh, 98% and our specificity is somewhere between 96 and 100% kind of depending, but you can dive deeper if you have somebody who's really interested and wants to pull out those validation reports. We make sure everything is very forward facing. So whether we have a publication on it, whether we have, um, but, and then everything is, is validated. That is all going to be forward facing on the website. Fantastic. And are those the numbers for, is that the range of specificity and sensitivity for the analytes in the neural zoomer plus? For the neural zoomer plus. Yes. Great. Those are pretty good. That's great. Yeah. Good. And can you, are you familiar with like ELISA testing or Western blot or some of the, I'm wondering if you can kind of give our viewers, this is a little tangential, but yeah. um, do you feel comfortable to talk a little bit about how this, like what the old technology is, what has been used? Sure, absolutely. So I will, um, so let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> maybe some of the limitations that come from ELISA and Western blot and the best you know, the best way to describe this is really through tick-borne testing. And a lot of this can be transitioned over into neural zoomer only because like a lot of these neural zoomer analytes, these neurological antibodies, like are maybe not even being tested if on kind of your standard Quest or LabCorp panel. So it's a little bit harder to say like, well, let's talk about this to this, but the technology is the same. So let's talk about ELISA first. So ELISA, you have these plates and there's individual wells and a certain antibody is put in there and we have to see this binding and emission of light and they're gonna be using something called chromodetection. Well, that has a very low level of sensitivity, one. So one, we're just kind of digging around in the, in the haystack, if you will. We may not be able to find it. We can miss it up to 40% of the time. That's a huge percentage. That means if you have 100 patients with Lyme disease, 40% of them, 40 of them, you're not going to find. Um, and on top of that, you can only put one antibody antigen into that well at a time. So now all of a sudden, you can only test one antibody. And the patient, you know, it's like, you just can't multiplex that because if we're talking about things like neurological antibodies, or we're talking about, um, 
tick-borne antibodies and all the different co-infections and all the different Borrelia species and all the different opportunistic infections, like you would need to have massive, massive labs and tons of lab, um, you know, scientists working to try and figure this all out. So like from a cost perspective, from a multiplexing to try and look at various different analytes, it's just not feasible. So you very often will see like, oh, okay, well, we just did an ELISA on Borrelia burgdorferi VLSE1. And if that's negative, then, well, it's negative, right? And it's like, well, but what about all this? What about everything else? So that's kind of it just in a, in a nutshell, ELISA. So that was pretty well known in tick-borne testing that like that was not going to be sufficient. And that's why the Western blot came to market um, because they were like, we have to look at more recumbent antigens, more parts of particularly Borrelia burgdorferi to be able to see like what is happening in this situation. And so when you have, uh, so a Western bot, you're actually uh, separating out all these different recumbent antigens from this pathogen um, with through a gel gradient with an electric charge. Well, what happens is like, there's a lot of proteins, protein clumping, they call it, basically things weigh the same. And so when you try to separate them out, you may get like band 41 for Borrelia burgdorferi has a very similar weight to Epstein-Barr. And guess what? 80 something percent of the population has been exposed to Epstein-Barr and probably has some antibodies to it. So now we're looking and saying, well, did did they have a Lyme exposure or were they just exposed to Epstein-Barr, right? So we start to get what we call cross-reactivity. Um, and as a provider, we're a little, we're more uncertain. We're like, well, yeah, I see like there's a positive band here, but it could also be these other things. So <clears throat> you're going to decrease, although that helps to increase the sensitivity, it decreases the specificity. So now maybe we found stuff in the in the haystack, but we're not 100% certain, certain that it's what we want to find or what we need to be treating for. So that's really just like in a nutshell, older technology. Because of the way the immunochip is developed, it really just overcomes those inherent limitations of an older technology to be able to give higher amounts of sensitivity and specificity so that we as providers and as patients, patients don't fall through the cracks, providers can be more confident in the testing and we can get them on a road to more accurate treatment sooner. Great, great, fantastic. Yeah. What about, just to throw another one in the mix, what about PCR? Yeah, so the the PCR testing that we do um, is a little bit different. We're using real time PCR. We're also using a PCR testing that is going to increase the sensitivity because we're going to target multiple genes. So instead of just looking for one section, we're going to be looking for multiple genes. That's helpful because you know a lot of times with these stealth infections, with the different things, is that we they're they're hiding, right? We need to be able to like be able to test across the board. So we are going to test uh, multiple genes there. We also offer with our PCR testing something called bead beading. And so <clears throat> when we're thinking about stealth infections, and there, there's a big infection piece on the neural zoomer plus, and this takes hold on there too. So it's not just in the on the Lyme test. Um, those infections can be in biofilms. And so we want to break up the biofilms to be able to have better access to the genetic material. And so we are going to agitate the sample with glass beads to try and break it apart. So then when we come in with our multiple targeted gene testing, we have a better likelihood to be able to identify it. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's dive down into, um, let's talk a little bit about immunology, kind of let's back up and talk a little bit about immunology and talk about like, what are antibodies, IgG, IgM, like IgA, what are all the differences there that we're looking at? Okay, great. So <clears throat> our body kicks out our immune globulins in reaction to, as our defense system. And so when we come in, um, again, I'm going to give you kind of some analogies. So depending on which immune 
um, you know, what, what type of infection is coming in, how our immune system is responding to it. So we have our IgMs, which I like to tell my patients are the Marines. And so they go in first. So if there's an invader, we're going to send our Marines in first. And so they're usually going to be your acute phase immunoglobulins. They're going in, they are going after our, um, whatever the foreign invader is. So if we see an IgM on testing, we are looking that this is a more recent, more active, more um, acute type um, threat that the immune system is alerted to. All right. And then over time, you're going to see a drop off of those IgMs and you're going to see a pickup of IgGs and your IgGs are more of your ground troops. So they're also there to try and keep track of everything and what's going on in the immune system, but they are there in after the Marines have kind of taken care of the quote unquote initial threat. So those ground troops are still having maybe a, a role in fighting initially, but they also can be acting as like memory cells and just kind of keep, you know, like, okay, we're here. We're just like on alert. We've seen this thing before and we're going to just kind of keep some very targeted ground troops that are going to be alerted to whatever that particular um, antibody might be um, or antigen might be. So you, um, you know, you're going to initially see those IgMs come up and then start coming back down. And then we see what we call serial conversion. We start to see our IgGs come up. And sometimes depending on the, you know, infection, depending on how, you know, if we're continually getting a little bit of agitation to the immune system, those IgGs can stay there for a long time. Um, if it's something that's more of an acute infection and then, you know, kind of drops off, we might see that some of that testing, some of those antibodies start to go down after four months, six months, something of that nature. But when we're talking some of these like neurological antibodies that have molecular mimicry with things that are in our environment, foods that we're eating, when we talk about tick-borne infections or other type of opportunistic infections that kind of can always have this low level and maybe aren't completely resolved, we might be seeing those IgGs for a very long time. So we want to make sure that we're testing both IgMs and IgGs so that we can get an idea of what the immune system sees. And that's an important piece of this testing is that it's a it's seeing we are testing the immune system and what the immune system sees, right? So we always have to understand like this is an indirect test of the immune system's function against whatever the molecular mimicry, whatever the tissue type might be, whatever the pathogen may be. Um, so that's kind of the basics there, IgM, IgG. We also have IgA. IgA is also considered an acute phase immunoglobulin, meaning it's closer to the beginning, um, not quite at the beginning as the IgM, but it's closer to the beginning of whenever this threat is, but it has high um, affiliation with mucous membranes. So we do tend to see this a lot more when we're talking about infections that have or pathogens or um, toxicants or something of that nature, some sort of foreign invader that's affected the gut lining, the, you know, other types of mucous membranes that are in the body. That's helpful for us to look at because, you know, particularly if we're talking like gut testing, we want to know like, what is it that's maybe impacting that mucous membrane that could be causing our intestinal permeability? It could be causing our gut inflammation, which ultimately can be affecting our overall immune system and that type of thing. So those are kind of your big differences there. Um, people might also see IgE, um, IgG, IgE is going to be, um, you know, your anaphylactic or your, your, um, um, highest amount of, you know, early on reaction there. Um, but we're not normally going to see an IgE reaction against like a pathogen per se. That's going to be an allergy of something, you know, in your environment, foods, things of that nature, but just kind of round it out. If anybody runs like a total immunoglobulin panel, which I absolutely recommend that you do anytime that you run a neural zoomer plus is that you get the total immunoglobulins. It's going to list all four. Um, just kind of side note, why that's important is because you want to know what's the total pool that you're pulling from. So if we're going to test a neurological antibody of IgG, 
We want to know what's the total pool of IgG that I'm pulling from. Because if I have low IgGs, maybe my immune system can't even pull enough for that particular, you know, antibody. So it's helpful in a, um, you know, kind of like clinical calibration. There's no like, you know, this number equals this number. But for us as providers, it helps us to kind of get an idea of this total pool that we're pulling from for this indirect test. Fantastic. And you make a really strong point here, which I just want to reiterate for the audience and call out, which is that um, th when we check these antibody tests, we're not looking for a, we're not seeing the organism necessarily like that. Might, we might see with the PCR, but with these antibody tests, we're actually looking for essentially the ghost signature of our body's response to that, um, right. that marker, be it an antibody, like a cell in our body. So we have a normal cell and then we can make an antibody to it if we perceive that that cell is now behaving as a threat and that's autoimmune disease, or we have an organism that now we have a chronic antibody to, and that's when we see chronic infection, we see a response, a chronic response. So right. that what we're looking at is really the, the immune system of the body as opposed to any kind of external threat at this point. Correct, correct. And that's why it's really important to run, you know, the total immune system function test with that, because sometimes the, you know, what we're looking at, that threat, depending on how long it's been there, what the threat is, can cause immune system compromise, can cause kind of the immune system to be quote unquote hijacked, if you will, where it's not necessarily acting the way that we should. The Marines never are transitioning to ground troops. And now all of a sudden it's 10 years later and they still have Marines active in a tick-borne infection. And it's like, because the immune system maybe isn't acting the way that we think that it should. So it's like, you want to, you want to look at the total immune system function so that you can get the best information that you can within that indirect test. Yep. Absolutely. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So armed, we're going to keep going with the, I like that Marine and ground troops. I've never heard that before. That's brilliant. So <laughs> for ground troops, let's head into the neural zoomer and let's talk about, can you walk us through kind of each section one by one and just talk to us about those, like what the section is kind of why or how it was chosen and some in the antibodies within it. Sure. Um, in order to do this, um, because sometimes I feel like, um, providers and patients kind of can lose the forest for the trees because all of a sudden we start being like anti-myelin basic protein, anti-aquaporin, anti-recoverin, anti, you know, it's like all becomes like kind of like word soup. Like what do all of these things mean? Um, I would love to kind of just give you the, I, what I call the hierarchy of consideration. How do I look at this test and make it make sense? But it will cover all of those sections per se, just in a way that's maybe not just like alphabetical. Is that okay? Yeah, that works. That's okay. great. Okay. So a little bit. So this test is a test that is not diagnostic, meaning we are not diagnosing Alzheimer's, MS, you know, these kind of disease and diseases. What it's doing is these are potentially predictive markers of what is the immune system seeing in a neuro autoimmune spectrum. And because there's a lot of diagnostic challenges and limitations that we have talked about already as far as with testing within that realm, there's no one specific test that tells you, oh, you have a neuro autoimmune you know, you know, condition or you have these things. So it's helping us to kind of bring together this information of like, what is the immune system seeing? Why is it maybe seeing it? So this is a really good test for patients who have neurological symptoms, but not necessarily like, Hey, you know, I want to, I want to rule out if I have Alzheimer's or not. Cause my dad had it. It's like, we can see how the immune system's responding in your central nervous system, but we're, we're not going to diagnose anything. Uh, we're going to help to figure out, <clears throat> Um, if you, I give you the analogy of a train, Alzheimer's would be at the end of the track. I want to mm -hmm. figure out what train you're on. Is mm -hmm. your train heading towards the end of that track? How fast mm -hmm. is the train going? How did you get on the train? Can I back the train up? Can I get you on a different track? Like those are the, that's the information that comes from this test. Um, and so 
thinking of that in the big picture is going to be why we are going to be looking at autoantibodies that are, um, you know, categorized in things like brain inflammation or brain autoimmunity or demyelinating or neuromuscular disorders. So again, not diagnosing MS, but telling us like, Hey, your myelin is a little bit is under attack. We know that there's molecular mimicry, meaning that there is some cross reactivity there with that myelin and something else your immune system is seeing. So now we can maybe have a treatment action item for it. Okay. So Uh, go ahead. Some of these antibodies we do use like in Western medicine as diagnostic components for like, so like the anti-aquaporin four would be a diagnostic antibody supporting neuromyelitis optica, right? Like some of these are, we do use as diagnostic criteria in Western medicine. Yes. And I do think that it depends on, is it IgM versus IgG, how high that type of thing. As far as from our lab testing, there is one marker that we do say it's diagnostic anti-glial fibrillary acidic protein 78 that is diagnostic of a traumatic brain injury um, because that particular protein is never on the outside of the central nervous system. So if the immune system is seeing it in a blood draw, which means it's on the outside of the central nervous system. Um, And yeah, there are definitely, um, you know, situations where in Western medicine, but I think that we're coming from a perspective of functional and integrative medicine, where it's like, how can we work with this patient to be able to get them a better outcome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, okay. So a <clears throat> couple of things that I have already, that I mentioned. So before I start talking about kind of the hierarchy of consideration that I look at is that um, I've kind of thrown around this like idea of molecular mimicry. Um, so just so patients have an idea, like molecular mimicry basically means that your immune system sees one thing and thinks that it's also, you know, it it's similar enough to a tissue, um, a part of self that it attacks both. So, you know, it could say, oh, you know, that myelin has purple dots and that pathogen has purple dots just to kind of keep things simple. And I don't know which one to go after. So I'm going to go after both. So there could be molecular mimicry against a pathogen, but there also could be molecular mimicry against a food. And so some of these antibodies that we're looking at have, I, you know, within the literature have, we've identified that there's certain foods, um, that or um, toxins or um, infections that can confuse the immune system. And then that can consequently cause it to kind of go after some neurological tissue. So when we are thinking of this test as a whole, the first thing we want to do when anything pops up positive is we want to know, are there particular um, analytes that have molecular mimicry with foods, toxins, something so that we can, init- that is our first step is we want to remove it. And so I, if you think of a pyramid, the base of the pyramid for this is identifying the molecular mimicry associations and identifying the triggers. Now that can be in a couple, those, those can be in a lot of different categories, but they become foundational in how we're going to treat this patient because those are the easy, low hanging fruits of things that we can control. If you have, you know, anti-cerebellum marker popping up, and that has a molecular mimicry with wheat and dairy, the very first thing I need to do is get you on a wheat and dairy free diet. So at least we kind of take that um, low hanging fruit or we take that trigger away from the immune system and we can start to really kind of calm things down. Hmm. Um, So that would be something that we would want to consider kind of at the base of the pyramid. Also knowing, are there any potential triggers? This is where the infection piece of this panel comes in because a lot of times things like Epstein-Barr or herpes viruses, um, strep can be very neuroinvasive and we wanna know where those triggers are at. So we identify the molecular mimicry, we identify kind of the infections, the known triggers that are happening. And again, that may cross some of those categories, but it helps us to get some really quick and be like, okay, we got to put them on an antiviral protocol. 
they, you know, we need to make sure they're off wheat and dairy. They had anti-aquaporin. You mentioned that before. We need to, you know, screen them for aquaporin um, reaction or at least take them off of things like corn and soy and, and other types of foods that have high aquaporins. So that's really kind of our foundational piece, which is going to cross a couple of those different categories. <clears throat> then the next is we want to look at the blood-brain barrier because if the brain is kind of seated at this seat of privilege behind a barrier and the immune system can't see it, we're in better shape than if the barrier is disrupted. If the barrier is disrupted and we have known triggers, like guess what, right? We've got this like highway that the immune system can have more attack within the central nervous system. So we do have four markers for blood-brain barrier disruption, and they have some different associations with them, similar to what we just talked about, but it helps us to give some ideas on like, why did the barrier get disrupted, right? Like, was it that anti, you know, glial fibrillary acidic protein? Like, did they have a traumatic brain injury? Were they in a car accident? Were they a football player? Did they have something that was like this acute trigger? Or something like anti-S100B, which could come from um, wheat, but it also could come from lime, right? There could be something much, a much more like lower grade chronic issue that could be kind of wearing down the, the barrier, keeping that barrier open. So we look at the barrier disruption how we potentially got there. And then we want to make sure that we're giving our patients things that they can do to, you know, try and work to keep their barriers nice, nice and healthy. So, you know, work with their gut, try and limit their electromagnetic radiation, work with their vagus nerve, like just kind of just general things, which I'm sure you've talked about a lot on your podcast before. So, um, those are going to be the very foundational pieces of this pyramid. And then everything else kind of like flows above that. Because if we want to talk about brain inflammation or we want to talk about brain autoimmunity, the inflammation comes if there's a break in the barrier and we have lots of triggers or molecular mimicry, the autoimmunity, same type of thing. And so we tend to be able to cut down on a lot of the like, this thing for the, you know, this treatment for this antigen, this treatment for this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, we can start to think of it collectively of, you know, all, what is at the base, what is flowing upwards to cause this inflammation, this type of autoimmunity that's in the system. Fascinating. Fascinating. So, so when we're thinking about the blood brain barrier, um, disruption, is there, should we weight any of these differently, these four markers, or is it kind of like, if any one of them is off, we're concerned? Um, so it, it depends on what's the cause, right? So like I, because I meant, like I mentioned before that glial fibular acidic protein is diagnostic. So like that's weighted pretty heavily because like we know that there was like an acute disruption because that protein in particular is supposed to only be in the central nervous system. So if it's across, if it's out systemically and where the immune system is seeing it and has created an antibody against it, then that is a, that's a serious break in the blood brain barrier. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, like, especially if you have a patient who's like, well, I don't, I've never had a concussion before. Right. I don't know. And then now we're thinking, I mean, I've seen it in situations of like hypoxic events. I've seen it, you know, post like surgery stuff, um, you know, if they had a complication during a surgery. So it wasn't necessarily like a hit on the head, but like their head was deprived of oxygen for a certain amount of time, or they had like a big um, insult per se um, with, with something else, a bit, you know, a, a big heavy metal exposure, something of that nature. So I've definitely seen that before, but we are trying to get dig deeper. Mm -hmm. um, when you have things like anti-S100B or glucose regulated protein 78, it gives us like, yes, those could be particularly the S100B could be from a concussion or a TBI, but it also could be from intestinal permeability. It also could be from weed exposure. It also could be from Lyme potential. So it just starts to give the provider more avenues of like what to look at. You know, is this a gut brain connection? 
Do we need to check them for Lyme? Is it a situation of neuroborreliosis? Maybe they did have a concussion, right? And it helps to give some answers around why the barrier is leaky. Um, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily say that like, you know, one is outweighs the other as much as I just want to make sure that I know which one is causing, you know, which one is there so that I know like, oh, this one needs to take out their aquaporins versus this one needs to take out wheat versus this one we need to really look at like, was there a hypoxic toxic event? And we need to maybe kind of go down that road of, of some other type of treatment. Got it. Got it. And so then let's look at, so for the brain inflammation, mm -hmm. so talk to us about those markers. Yeah. So let me, I, there's a lot in brain inflammation. And so uh -huh. <laughs> I always like to pull them up to make sure that I have them here for you. Um, so a lot of these brain inflammation markers, you know, we have something like anti NMDA receptor marker that can have some association with Lyme as well. Um, we've got your, um, and some of the markers can have, um, different associations with like perineoplastic syndromes. And so it helps to give us some indication here of, you know, what could be, what, what, where's the path of inflammation kind of going and also maybe where it's, you know, how is it affecting different parts of, um, the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the, and then the autoimmunity, how do those differ from kind of like just the straight up inflammation markers? Yeah. And that's actually, a that's a great question. And I actually get this from providers a lot when we're doing clinical training. So they're like, well, but like, what about this one over here, or this one over here? And it's like anything that's in your brain autoimmunity bucket could potentially be caused from inflammation and, you know, your inflammatory markers could be leading down to autoimmunity. Um, you know, I've talked to the scientists at the lab a lot and they really hone in on the fact that it's like, it, we know that it's not an either or, but for simplicity of trying to put things in categories on the test, we looked at the research collectively and said, okay, these are most likely, you know, triggering inflammation versus most likely looking at, um, at autoimmunity, but there's going to be crossover because you can't un, un, you know, undo inflammation and autoimmunity together. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that like, we can pull out all of the research and be like, here's all the things. And you're going to just see crossover from one to the other, which is why they like collectively are kind of at that top of the pyramid to, to look at. And it seems like from what I've looked at in the past, like the brain inflammation markers are things that when you have those antibodies, you're going to trigger essentially a perception of threat or an attack to um, elements of the brain that are going to potentially then release cytokines or then be inflammatory mm -hmm. versus something in the brain autoimmunity, like anti-cerebellum or anti-Purkinje cell, which is just targeting one particular cell type that would then be in that spot. I don't know if that's actually how vibrant was thinking about it. Yeah, but I think that that is, <laughs> I do think that that is, I do think that that is correct. Yeah. I think that you're going to see like, okay, so if we're looking, if we're just attacking in on the Purkinje cells or we're just attacking in, you know, versus dopamine receptors, if, is it a cytokine issue or is it a cell, you know, type issue, tissue type issue? Um, and I, yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that there would be that differentiation there. Um, you know, the big, the, the most common answer I get from our scientists is just like, you know, we kind of, they always like to run everything through an algorithm, right? So they get all the science, they run all, all through an algorithm. And it's like, it, these ones are most commonly, you know, triggering off inflammation, cytokines, that type of thing versus most commonly going after a certain tissue type, but they're going to be kind of, you know, there's always going to be crossover there. So in this brain inflammation and autoimmunity categories, we have like the anti-dopamine receptor one and anti-dopamine receptor two. And those are two of the markers that are on the Cunningham panel. Yeah, Can you talk absolutely. to us a little bit about the Cunningham panel and like same, same differences with the vibrant panel? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, Cunningham has, um, four, um, antibodies, and then they also have their cam kinase, which is a culture, which is proprietary to them. Um, with the neural zoomer, we have the exact same four 
antibodies, um, but we don't have the cam, cam kinase. Now, there are, is some research out there that a collection that it's, you know, even though not having the cam kinase, because we offer the same level of antibodies with the anti-dopamine one and two, GM1 and anti-tubulin, um, that we can still get a very accurate picture of, you know, a PANDA's presentation um, for our patients or an autoimmune encephalopathy secondary to a strep infection or infection for an adult, um, even without that CAM kinase. And the benefit that you have from the neural zoomer is that you also get 42 other autoantibodies. So then you can start to see that information around things like the blood brain barrier, which we've talked um, about, or other types of maybe brain autoimmunity or brain inflammatory markers or other situations that might be happening with the um, myelin or, or whatnot. So um, we do have those panels. And from a cost perspective, um, our test is a fraction, the cost of the Cunningham panel. Um, you're going to get those four um, um, antibodies plus all of the additional. So it does really make it a more comprehensive test. I mean, we're very thankful to um, the people at, you know, who've developed the Cunningham panel. They've done tons of research and stuff. But when we're looking, just kind of comparing antibodies to antibodies, um, we're going to be testing the same ones as on the Cunningham panel um, so that we can look at that. And then in the infection section, we do have um, an, our, your strep antibodies um, so that we can see if there was a you know potential um, triggering off because of strep. Um, but we also are going to include those viral markers too. So if we have a PANS situation versus a PANDAS situation, you know, we can see if a herpes virus, a cytomegaly virus, an Epstein bar, something of that nature could be the trigger instead in more of a PANS presentation, meaning that there's not the strep component there. So that is why the infection piece is part of our Neural Zoomer Plus so that we can include all of that type of information to the patients. Great. And so um, one question I've had from patients is like, so if these are checking neural antibodies and I have, you know, herpes, do I have herpes in my brain? So it is, we're not testing cerebral spinal fluid, mm -hmm. right? So this is a blood test. So I can just tell you what your immune system was happening in your immune system in the blood draw that we got. But we have to then clinically correlate. That's why we look at things like blood brain barrier disruption. That's why we look at what could possibly be the sequela from the herpes, right? We know herpes can be neuroinvasive. Now we put that together to say, oh, and you have a break in your blood brain barrier. Oh, and you have a lot of neuroinflammation going on and you have some neuroautoimmunity. Like I can hypothesize, I can say, you know, it appears that that herpes virus is neuroinvasive. It has gone into the central nervous system, or at least the sequela of inflammation, cytokines, whatever has impacted your central nervous system. But I'm very clear that like, I am not, we're not doing a spinal tap. Like this is not your cerebral spinal fluid. So again, that's where we have to have that discussion of like, this is an indirect test. Mm -hmm it helps us to see what the immune system sees. And then we can clinically correlate to what the patient is telling us. And we can put those pieces together as the provider, but it's not just a like, Oh, herpes in the brain, you know, tissues look like this. We, there's a lot of clinical interpretation and correlation that has to happen, um, to be able to really pull that together. Great. Great. Um, so let's look at, there's a few other categories. Um, so let's talk next about, do you have a preference? <laughs> uh, I don't, but I can, let me just see here. Or is, there that, is there one that's popping out at you that you, that you want to talk about? Well, I'm just wondering, like in your hierarchy of, you know, in your decision tree, as you're discuss as you're thinking about these things, like, yeah. You know, the, the categories remaining are kind of the optic, um, optical and autonomic nervous system, peripheral neuropathy, and the demyelination. So yeah. 
And, so or I would the, say the, it's going to drive what category I'm going to look at is going to be based on like the patient's presentation first. And majority of those markers, um, you know, we're going to be looking and seeing what is, is kind of, they, they get addressed in the like triggers slash molecular mimicry section. If there's something that we can clinically do about it. Right. I mean, sometimes we look and we're like, all right, you know, so under like optical and autonomic, like we have the anti-recoverant. Okay. Well that's associated with like retinopathy for our patients. So when was the last time you had your eyes checked, right? Have you had, you know, have you had a detailed look at your retina? Like there might not be any particular molecular mimicry or something like a treatment action item I can do, but it can be something that I can say, okay, we need to get some further work up here. And then we also need to monitor that as it's related to your clinical symptoms. So, you know, those would be the markers that I start to pull in and be like, okay, that makes sense. Okay, this makes sense with the type of presentation that you're coming in with, um, that type of thing. So we could also look at, and you mentioned the anti-aquaporin, right? So then we're gonna have, you know, some information there about, um, the molecular mimicry with things like corn and soy and spinach and tomatoes and tobacco. And so we can really talk to our patients about those treatment action items. And our ultimate goal always when we identify these is to clinically correlate, take care of the treatment that we can, and then monitor, bless you, and then monitor where we're at and what we expect to see is that if somebody comes in and they have a lot of IgMs with these antibodies, we anticipate that over time of treatment, we are going to start to see those IgMs zero convert to IgGs. So the Marines start to go down, the ground troops start to go up. And then over time, we start to see those ground troops start to kind of go to a lower level. Now, will we ever see them completely go away? Um, maybe not, because they can be a memory cell at certain level where the, the immune system is just like, hey, I'm going to keep some troops there just in case. Like, I've seen this before. We want to make sure that everything's good. So you could see like a 10 to 20 percent decrease. But if somebody had really high levels before, they still may end up kind of landing in a moderate situation, even if their clinical picture clears. So when we look at these different markers, especially the ones that let's say there's not any quote unquote, like targeted treatment that we can do, the value in the marker is that serial um, detection over time as we run them through kind of our big picture treatment plans, all the different things that you're going to do, and making sure that we're addressing how the immune system is responding to that particular tissue per se. Great, great. And so um, the neuromuscular disorders, like how do those, how do those anti-muscle specific kinase, anti-voltage gated calcium or potassium channels. How do those impact the body? What might we see clinically with those? Let me get my list here just so that I can pull those out. Like I said, this test is really, you know, has a lot of markers on it and we want to make sure that, um, especially when I'm talking about them and I'm not getting them, um, mixed up per, you know, category and whatnot. So, you know, so when we talk about our neuromuscular disorders, for sure, these are going to be markers that, you know, are a lot of times our patients, these are some of the symptoms that are coming in with, right? They tend to have um, fatiguing muscles. Their muscles tend to be really, you know, stiff per se. And again, we're not necessarily diagnosing, you know, something like, um, stiff man syndrome or Lambert Eaton or myasthenia gravis, but it helps to give us a clue because a lot of these things can also be, you know, it's, it's an autoimmune reaction that now is going after that neuromuscular junction per se. And so it gives us again, that maybe why, you know, what's going on here. So we're going to be able to see, you know, what's happening, um, to give maybe some ideas around why the patient is 
having those fatiguing muscles or cannot, you know, kind of, they're like, I've done everything and I, you know, still can't get some answers. Um, so that's where those pieces would come in. Great. Great. Um, and then we've got, um, four or five in peripheral neuropathy group. So again, we'd be looking at neuropathies, at numbness, at tingling, at changes in sensation. Absolutely. Stiff person syndrome again. So stiffness, we're going to see a lot of sensory issues there. Um, this is also where like anti GM one and GM two come in, um, which are again, part on um, the GM one is going to be part of the Cunningham panel. So we're going to see some, um, kind of crossover that that is also, you know, can be part of that kind of pan panda situation, um, presentation. Um, and so, <clears throat> Most of the time, again, when we have patients who already come in reporting that they have, um, you know, these weird myoclonic spasms or that they have some sort of like sensory um, deficit per se, um, and now we can um, identify those autoantibodies and look at them. And then it's like we can um, have a determination of like, you know, some of these, let's talk about anti-GM1 again, like, you know, that can go back, like we talked about with Panda, with, with strep, it could be triggered off by, by um, a strep infection. It could be triggered off by a um, Campylobacter infection, something in the GI system. So it helps to give us some ideas around that. We could be talking about patients who have celiac, maybe an undiagnosed celiac presentation. Um, so it gives us some other indications of like what could be triggering off those motor neuropathies, um, the pain, weakness, atrophy, things of that nature. Got it. Got it. Okay, great. So let's, so we've talked about all these antibodies. We've talked about um, the marker antibodies against infective agents, against our own tissues, against inflammatory tissues, um, blood brain, brain barrier disruption, let, how do you approach treatment and not saying that like, you know, this is a treatment plan, but just like, how do you approach treatment when you see these, when you get positives on this test? So that always goes back to that hierarchy of consideration. What can I control? What can I not control? What can I determine why they got on the bus or why they got on the train? Right. And is there a way for me to kind of manipulate the train that they're on. And so you're going to start to figure out, okay, what can I control first? Is there a dietary change that I can make? Is there an infection that I can treat? Is there a um, heavy metal or mycotoxin or something else that potentially could be causing a trigger here? So again, it's like identifying the antibody helps to really just give you the roadmap of what you can control. And then if there are markers that need additional workup, right? Like I mentioned that maybe they need to, we need to refer out to um, make sure that they have an up-to-date, you know, retinal scan that we make sure that that is, that we're looking at for that. Maybe it is um, a, a, a test that has some other type of association with Mycenia gravis, right? So we talked about the, the anti-acetylcholine and we talked about my, and there's myasthenia gravis, but it's like, maybe we need to have them do a full workup for myasthenia gravis. Like we're seeing that they're having fatigue. Um, they're having these failing muscles. Like maybe we need to start to look at that and look at, you know, where that needs to go for them. If that's not in our own wheelhouse of something that we can treat, now we can refer to a neurologist who can like maybe do further, do that workup. And then we can co-manage on that situation. So I think that's a big piece is like control what you can control, refer out to what you need to refer out for and understand that some of these things have associations with, you know, a, with conditions that need further workup. It's a, it helps to give you an indication. And then the other ones we need to monitor and we need to say, okay, you know, I mean, especially when the patients, when there's a lot of positives, then we come in and we say, okay, we're going to control what we can control. We're going to put you on the treatment plan. We're going to seal up the barrier. We're going to treat the infections. We're going to take you off the foods that are causing molecular mimicry. I'm going to treat you for heavy metals. And then in six months, we're going to retest you and we're going to see how this all shakes out. 
is your immune system responding the way that we think it should? Is, are the IgMs converting to IgG? Are those IgGs decreasing? And what you happen to, what you likely will see is that some of these markers that maybe don't have a direct treatment action item, they still start to get better because collectively the whole system is working better. It's right. such a great point. There's we, when, when patients ask me kind of why to do this test or how I use this test, I tell them it's in two directions. So the first is looking at what antibodies are actually positive and whether there's further workup required exactly as you discussed. So the um, neuromyelitis optica with the aquaporin four, the, um, the, um, you know, if there's pandas, um, if there is, um, a musk antibody, then we're looking at myasthenia gravis. If there's, mm -hmm. we can look for a specific thing. If there's perineoplastic, like anti-yo, then often we'll do a chest CT because that can result in small cell lung carcinoma. So, yep. mm -hmm. um, there's a close association. So we want to do all that work up to look at the actual individual markers, but then the second piece, and I think this is where Western medicine is really going, but hasn't gotten yet, is that we name autoimmune disease by the target tissue, by the tissue targeted. But what it's the problem is really in the central perception and behavior of the immune system. Right. So the, the immune system is going to the fair and, you know, they're playing, if the immune system is playing the game where the different components pop up and you've got to shoot the bad guy with the gun, but not the lady with the baby and the immune system's getting confused and shooting the lady and not shooting the guy with the gun. Right, right. So that's kind of what we're seeing when we have autoimmune disease. And it's a problem of perception and behavior of the immune system versus actually which tissues tend to be popping up. And so right. I use this a lot if, um, for how many antibodies we have, how much shooting, how much errant shooting the immune system is doing. And so that's a lot of how I determine or direct care in terms of um, how intensive do we have to be with treatment? Is this a low dose naltrexone situation or is this a steroid situation? Is right, right, right. How much collateral damage is happening at the fair right now? <laughs> I love that analogy. I love that. I mean, I, I just, I think that's a great analogy because you're right. It's not the lady with the baby's fault, right? It's not the tissue's fault. They're just kind of like popping up, but it's the immune system's reaction. I think that's a really nice visual, um, that it's like, we had to deal with why it's shooting. And so you definitely will, you know, if you can calm all of that down, and sometimes it can be, you know, that blanket approach, you can calm it down, then it just is not shooting as much. Exactly. And so in Ayurvedic medicine, Ayurveda of the eight branches of Ayurvedic medicine, you know, which is my background and foundation and passion and love, um, you know, in Ayurvedic medicine, there's one of the entire eight branches is called Rasayana or rejuvenation. So the idea is that the immune system is having an erroneous perception. So we need to calm down and correct the perception and behavior of the immune system. We have to rejuvenate or restore its intellectual clarity so that mm -hmm. it can make the right decisions and how it behaves. And so right. if you are, if you are that immune system standing at the fair shooting that gun, and there's like a dog biting at your heels and somebody like singing in your ear, or if there's thunderstorms, as we were just talking about are happening in Colorado, as we speak, if mm -hmm. you have too many distractions, you're going to make more mistakes. So how do we decrease the distractions of the immune system? How do we let it really calm down? And that is absolutely with the foundations of health, with breath work, with trauma resolution, with sleep, with diet, with food, with lifestyle, everything that we can potentially control and knowing that there are some, you know, there's elements in the world beyond us that we can't control, whether right. politics, racism, you know, all of these things that are going to be potential oppressors on our system, but we want to do as much control or management as we can so that the immune system can make the best choices that it can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I use yeah. a lot, one of the things that I like about this test is that there is a category, uh, there's a category for moderate and then a category for elevated. And so the way that I describe that to patients is that moderate category, I think of, um, I think of it's kind of what's on the horizon and we don't necessarily know if this is a rising sun or a setting sun. We're just getting a snapshot of the horizon. So we don't know if these are things that were elevated that are now kind of going down, or if these are things that are just starting to really rise. So that's another 
um, benefit of doing serial testing, um, depending on what immune interventions you're using. We use a lot of IVIG in our practice. And so, mm -hmm. or, and we use plasmapheresis in our practice, which is going to pull out all of your immunoglobulin G. It's going to pull out those immune factors and a lot of the cytokines and other components. So right. that can really shift. You have to make sure to, you know, we make sure to do this kind of testing, preferably at least a month three to four weeks apart from any kind of IVAG treatment or uh, plasmapheresis treatment. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Wonderful. So any other thoughts, anything else we should know about this test? Any, uh, any uh, insider information about kind of where insider it's going? Insider information, or... I know. So as far as this particular test, um, we don't have anything kind of on the horizon that would be being added or changed about the neural zoomer itself. It's a very complete test. It gives a lot of information. Um, what we are as a lab doing is we actually have a couple different um, more autoimmune um, panels. We have a Lyme autoimmunity panel coming out, which is going to start giving us some ideas around like, is is it a persistent infection or is it the autoimmune sequela happening that a lot of times the symptoms for the patient can present exactly the same way. So there's particular um, antibodies that it very much as, you know, similar to the neural zoomer, but these antibodies that can tell us that are, have this association with um, neuroborreliosis or with Lyme carditis or with um, arthritis. And so um, we can start to look and say like, if we do a tick-borne test and it doesn't appear, it looks like their immune system seen Lyme before, but it's not an active infection, but they still are very symptomatic. Now we can look and say like, maybe it's just the immune system that's, you know, at the fair shooting a lot of different things and it's going after the joints or going after the brain. Um, and so that's coming down later this summer. Um, and so we're starting to take a bigger picture look at um, not just you know, neurological autoimmunity, but kind of just like autoimmune, uh, autoimmunity in various different systems. So we definitely have a lot of information coming um, out for those. As far as in the neurological realm, we are going to be offering some neurological genetics, and I don't have the specifics on the um, on the exact SNPs we're going to be looking at yet, but we're going to start looking at, you know, some people are more um, genetically predisposed to having neurological, you know, sequelas and problems than other people um, and starting to be able to bring that in so we can really help to give our patients the best foundation. So we have our hands kind of in a lot of different things to help mm -hmm. really round out um, you know, how the provider looks at the patient. So whether you're thinking Lyme, you will have another option, whether you're thinking just autoimmunity, you will have this expanded autoimmune panel, uh, whether you're looking at neurological, we'll start to, to look at genetics. And so we can just continue to always be on the cutting edge of, you know, offering the best amount of information. So our providers can give the best information to their patients. Cause the more targeted information you have, the more that you can really like hone in on the type of treatment plan that they need. Fascinating. That's great. That's great. I look forward to that. That's like the million dollar question, you know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Is it like, what is happening? So yeah. Yeah. That's it's going to be fascinating. Um, the different markers that are coming through and being able to really make that determination. Cause I mean, this has been controversy in the, you know, Lyme world forever of like, is it a persistent infection or is it just a, you know, rogue immune system that still looks like a persistent infection? And these patients who have been on, you know, IV antibiotics for years, like, and they still have the same symptoms or they still have the same flare ups, right? Like maybe it's, maybe they don't need to be in a kill protocol anymore. <laughs> maybe we need to heal their immune system. <laughs> so um, you know, maybe we need to look at the terrain, maybe we need to do all these other things. So it's going to help within that space. And that's a type of testing that just hasn't been available before mm -hmm. to be able to say like, you know, what's going on in this situation. Oh, fantastic. Great. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. We're so grateful. This has been such a fun conversation, really useful conversation. Um, I like that hierarchy of consideration. Um, so that's fantastic. Wonderful. And we love that you. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And we love that you've joined us today to our listeners to discuss how to make our whole world medicine. We rise or fall together and are committed to sharing knowledge and insight that empower us and our communities towards greater health. Thank you for listening to the Nerveda podcast for complex health, and we'll see you next time. 